Thank you, Mio, and uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, today's webinar, in which I would like to highlight how PEG biosequencing can be used to uh, sequence difficult or maybe even impossible regions in the genome. Um, I borrowed the title, the phrase NGS dead zone from a uh, excellent review paper um, uh, that's shown here entitled Navigating Highly Homologous Genes in a Molecular Diagnostic Setting, a resource for clinical next generation sequencing by Mandelker and, and colleagues, uh, which highlights that there are many regions in the genome that are difficult to characterize with NGS. The GenCode project identified well over 10,000 unique pseudogenes to date and pseudogenes tend to be challenging for short read NGS and even Sanger sequencing because of their high similarity to the corresponding gene. And so um, with the pseudogenes, you then have a risk of many false positive or false negative variant calls, which result from inaccurate mapping of short reads to the highly homologous regions, including the pseudogenes. And so in this uh, review paper from last year, there's, there are tables like this one um, which call out, and, and the authors call this NGS dead zone. So these are genes right here that you see in the first column that are uh, linked to known diseases that are shown in this column here, but um, they're very difficult to get at with um, NGS currently and uh, uh, impossible, in fact. And many of the reasons, uh, many genes uh, have pseudogenes, and that's the reason why they're difficult to address. So. Um, there are 103, 193 medically relevant genes uh, that are in the so-called NGS problem list from this paper. And uh, it turns out that um, 84%, uh, 163 of these are resolvable with PECBio. More generally, there are um, well over 1,000 genes that are in the NGS problem list, uh, medically relevant or not. And again, 80%, close to 1,000 of these are resolvable with PECBio. So why is that possible? Well. It's because of the underlying performance characteristics of single molecule real time or smart sequencing that are shown here and that many of you will be familiar. Um, the combination of the long reads averaging now between 10 and 18 kilobases, the high consensus accuracy, the absence of systematic errors leading to greater than 99.999 or QV50 accuracy, the lack of sequencing bias. Uh, allowing all different sequence contexts to be sequenced, and then um, lastly, the ability to uh, measure DNA modifications as part of the um, sequencing process. So all of these characteristics allow um, the interrogation of uh, regions that are previously uh, impossible. And so there are a lot of um, opportunities for PECBio to go beyond the 150 or so basis that you see on the left here that you have with short read sequencing to enable uh, routinely and in the clinical setting a number of important applications, um, full length phase gene sequencing where um, the variants are called uh, for both alleles, the mother and the father allele, and phased into their entirety. Um, the gene, pseudo, gene pseudogene discrimination I just talked about. Um, being able to access extreme sequence context, very GC-rich or very AT-rich regions, minor variant detection and methylation detection. So in the following, I'd like to give some examples how researchers have used the technology and the protocols that we have developed to facilitate addressing these um, areas. So the first one is on full-length phase gene sequencing, and uh, one of the um, most uh, popular methods where PEC biosequencing is used now is for HLA typing. I won't get, go into that in detail if you're interested in uh, this particular area. Of course, HLA is one of the most important gene families um, as a whole, um, responsible for a whole host of diseases and also for transplantation. There's an excellent review paper by Steve Marsh and colleagues, HLA typing for the next generation, highlighting the benefit of PEC biotechnology to get full length class one and class two HLA genes. Uh, histogenetics has uh, typed over 100,000 samples last year alone and um, is continuing to do so and scale up that capability. I'd like to talk in a little bit more detail about another area where full length phase gene sequencing is important and that is in the area of drug metabolism or DMET uh, gene typing. Um, 
individuals differ in their capacity to metabolize medicine. And so you have a distribution of um, people who can um, metabolize drugs very rapidly versus having um, patients that uh, can metabolize the drugs very poorly. And that is, the, these phenotypes are linked to their appropriate genotypes in the drug metabolizing genes. And so it's of great importance for the uh, clinician and the physicians to know whether the patient would metabolize the drug very quickly, uh, so that you need a higher dose, or whether they are poor metabolizers, so you have to be careful and give them only a, a small dose. And these genes are highly polymorphic, and um, it is important to go past, uh, in this figure you see the genotype, but the genotype is a concept that's really uh, born out of limitations of technology, and really what you want is what's called the diplotype. So um, you're all familiar with the haplotype, which is um, on one of the chromosomes, um, the uh, occurrence of mutations, and then the genotype would be uh, let's say here a heterozygous mutation, but what you really want for full and comprehensive characterization of a per patient's genome is the diplotype, which is composed of the two haplotypes, um, i.e. the multiple genotypes on the homologous uh, chromosomes. So the answer would be here capital letters ABC on one of the haplotypes and lowercase ABC. And so this is afforded with PEC biosequencing and has been published on one very critical gene that's um, important in drug metabolism. It's called CYP2D6. Um, two papers have um, appeared in the journal Human Mutation, one from Mount Sinai, the other from researchers in the Netherlands, demonstrating that it's now possible with PEC biosequencing to flexibly and scalably sequence CYP2D6 at full length. And so there was another uh, uh, review article in Drug Discovery Magazine um, that is a more high-level um, commentary on this. So in the first paper, in the first study by Mount Sinai, um, um, Stuart Scott and colleagues um, first validated the smart sequencing pipeline. They used 10 DNA samples that they had previously characterized with the Luminex assay or the TACMAN copy number assay. These are PCR-based assays. And then here you see the smart sequencing assay giving you the diplotype information. And even for these control samples, they were able to refine the genotype using smart sequencing, uh, identify a duplication of an allele, and even find novel alleles, even in what they thought were control samples. So that um, highlights the high resolution of smart sequencing in this particular area. And then they, um, in a second uh, study, they characterized samples that had given different results with the previous methods, Luminex or Tacman copies, to resolve those and use smart sequencing. And again, here, they were able to resolve the diplotype uh, into the different alleles, refine the genotypes, characterize allele duplications, and even find a completely novel tandem arrangement that had never been uh, seen before and there was a new discovery. Um, Stuart Scott and colleagues have also now um, made developed and made available the um, toolkit, the bioinformatics toolkit to genotype and phenotype. Uh, they have uh, released bioinformatics software uh, called ELEC that um, gives those um, results and then a translator that converts the sequence variants into the uh, star allele conversion that has been um, uh, set by the SIP allele nomenclature committee. So it's now very straightforward to go from the PEC bio data all the way to the final answer. I also want to know that in the second paper from the researchers in the N Netherlands, um, they highlighted that it's um, a very flexible scheme. This is based on long range PCR. So for the SIP2D6 gene locus, it was a 6.6 KB fragment covering the entire gene and the upstream and downstream regions. And uh, you can see that it was done in a two-step barcoding scheme where in the first PCR, um, the locus, the CYP2D6 locus is amplified, and then there are um, universal adapters, um, M13-based forward and reverse universal adapters that then in a second-step PCR allow to add barcodes um, that uh, index the particular patients, and then it can be pooled and sequenced on a single smart cell. 
And so, so that's very flexible because if you want to now move from one locus to another gene, another subgene, for example, all you need to do is buy two primer pairs with those universal adapters and the second step PCR stays the same. So it's very flexible and can easily be adapted to profiling other genomic targets without the need for significant additional investments. In general, I want to highlight that PEC-Bio for targeted amplicon sequencing is inherently much simpler than what you uh, have for short read or Sanger because as the inserts of interest become longer than say 1 kb, you have to have multiple primer sets and walk yourself through these regions. That's not necessary for PEC, with PEC-Bio because of the long reads and up to about 10 kb, all you need is two uh, primer pairs, a long-range PCR and then the amplicon is sequenced full length. And uh, then just like other technologies, we have sets of uh, barcodes, 384 barcodes that are optimized for smart sequencing, which allows then the pooling and simultaneous sequencing of hundreds of targets and samples. The software will automatically identify the barcodes and then analyze the uh, molecules for each barcode separately and then give you the answer. Beyond PCR, um, sometimes it's of interest to characterize larger regions of the genome. And so probe-based enrichments like the IDT uh, or roche nimble gin or Agilent Sure Select uh, can be used for that. Uh, the difference now is though that with um, PEC-Bio, you're pulling down and then sequencing much longer fragments um, on the order of about five or six kilobases compared to uh, um, 200 base pair fragments with Illumina, such as the mice. And so that uh, results in very different pictures of um, the genes that you're interested in. And a direct comparison is shown here. This is from the standard nimble gen oncology panel for cancer, uh, a gene called MUTYH, um, um, that's a cancer gene. And you can see that with the long peg biofragments that are being captured, uh, you can get a full characterization of the entire gene, all the exons, all the introns, and that uh, information is phased, whereas with the mice you only have the probes against the exons, and so you have those skyscrapers, uh, reads piling up around the exons, but then there's missing information, and the information is, uh, the variants are not phased. Uh, the phasing ability is shown in a second example here. This is exon 10 of BRCA1, the breast cancer gene, where the pec bio reads can easily be grouped into two different uh, bins that represent the two different alleles, the maternal allele and the paternal allele here. And so you can see that all these variants um, compared to the reference are uh, completely phased. And whereas with Illumina, this is not possible because the reads are too short um, to be uh, uh, phased into the two alleles. And of course, phasing of variants is very important. Um, for example, in the area of cancer, it is um, of great importance to know whether mutations that uh, occur in these tumor suppressor genes are both on the same allele or are on different alleles. So in this um, example up here, uh, there's two mutations and you have one mutation on the first allele and another mutation on the second allele. That means both of the genes are defective. Whereas in the second case, you have the same two mutations but now with PEC-Bio, you can understand that both of these mutations are on the same allele, which means that one of the tumor suppressor gene copies is still intact. And this has implications on the diagnosis of the patient and the, uh, the therapy and the uh, course of treatment. In addition, it is possible with PEC-Bio uh, in this targeted um, uh, probe-based scheme to identify larger structure variation, so going beyond single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Here's an example of PDE4DIP, that's another cancer gene, where it is easily recognized with PEC-Bio that there is a deletion in one of the alleles of about 740 base pairs, and this deletion contains an entire exon, and all of that was missed with the corresponding MySeq data uh, because the reads are too short and they cannot um, resolve this particular uh, structure variant. So then um, uh, continuing and, and coming back to the original gene pseudogene discrimination, 
one of the examples um, I already talked about actually does have a pseudogene. So the CYP26 um, drug metabolism gene that I was talking about earlier has a highly similar pseudogene very close by. The two uh, genes have 97% homology, but because of the long reads with PecBio, it's now possible to place the primers in unique regions that are specific to the CYP2D6 gene and do not occur around the pseudogene. And so uh, with that, there's no high identity off-target sequence alignments indicating that pseudogene contamination was not present in uh, the data. This is from the uh, uh, European study on CYP2D6. So that means that with uh, PEC biosequencing and the long reads, it is possible to discriminate much more easily between uh, sequence reads that come from the gene and from the pseudogene or eliminate pseudogene contamination altogether. Here's another example um, from this list of NGS dead zone. Uh, this gene is called PMS2. It causes, a, um, it causes colon cancer. Mutations in this gene cause colon cancer. And this is another example. This gene has a very large region, about 17 kilobases, that are within their exons over 99.2% identical to a nearby pseudogene. And so with um, short read sequencing, it's impossible to tell whether mutations in that gene come from the, uh, from the actual PMS2 gene or come from the pseudogene. And um, so uh, in collaboration, we um, amplified um, 17 kilobases spanning exons 10 to 15. Again, there was no map pseudogene because exon 10 is specific to the PMS2 gene. And then uh, the long amplicon analysis that is part of our software package allows um, the full resolution of the entire 17 kb section of this gene into the two diplotypes. So this is, these are two samples, a wild type sample, and this was from a cancer patient here. And you can see the entire region with all the uh, different mutations, homozygous or heterozygous mutations. Um, and then uh, one last example is a recent paper um, by another European group um, on a gene called PKD1. This particular gene causes kidney disease. And in the previous um, clinical standard of um, characterizing this gene, um, it was a cumbersome workflow. So four uh, long-range PCR uh, reactions had to be run, and then followed by about 50 or so nested PCR, uh, and then Sanger sequencing. Because again, there's about six pseudogenes of the PKD1 gene, and so um, short rate sequencing, Illumina sequencing was not suitable. Uh, and then after all these Sanger sequencing reactions, the researchers had to do another um, assay, which is multiplex ligation dependent probe amplification or MLPA to uh, detect larger structure variation. So this is uh, slow, expensive, and very cumbersome. And all of these uh, workflows uh, in this papers described were replaced by PEC biosequencing. Um, only five long range PCRs were required and then those pieces can be sequenced directly and continuously with um, PEC biosequencing. And the uh, MLPA assay is not required at all as part of this assay. So the researchers show in the paper that it has great sensitivity and concordance with the Sanger results, and there are even variants that were detected with PEC bio that were missed with the uh, previous uh, clinical protocol. So, um, I want to just briefly show a number, a uh, few other examples where the PEC bio long reads can span uh, highly homologous um, gene regions. I already talked about CYP2D6. I've highlighted three others, but uh, the table is larger and shows uh, medically relevant genes that PEC bio covers very well, but which have a blind spot um, with Illumina sequencing. So here is um, the gene called GBA um, causing Gaucher's disease. Um, you can see that there's entire uh, regions missing uh, in the Illumina reads, whereas the PEC bio reads uh, go through that completely. Uh, a very similar situation with uh, a gene called IKBK gene. Um, and uh, here is again a repeat element that is a blind spot for the Illumina technology. And again, PEC bio can cover this particular region. And also here, uh, CFC1, 
um, which causes heart uh, defects. Again, the PEG bi reads can go through this um, um, entire gene region, whereas the Illumina reads provide a very fragmented and partial view. Um, there are even entire exons are missing, and there are clinical variants in those regions that are missed with the Illumina technology, but are resolvable with PEC bio. So in general, I just want to close this section by pointing out that um, what many uh, in the field call a so-called quote-unquote full gene analysis is really only a full exon analysis because as in the previous example, you saw that um, all these nested PCR reactions and Sanger sequencing really only look at the uh, exons and uh, the introns of the gene are really not looked at all. And so with the PEC biotechnology, uh, for the first time now, we actually have a full gene analysis detecting all the variants in the exons and, and in the introns, um, also looking at uh, potential splice variants and splice defects that would uh, be caused by variants that are introns. And this also allows much better discrimination to pseudogenes because there are typically more variants in uh, introns compared to exons, which are more highly uh, conserved. So as um, a one example, a case in point, again, coming back to this gene called PMS2, um, the region that is highly homologous, as I mentioned, is 99.2% identical in the exons. However, it's only 98.2% identical looking at the entire gene region. So there are a lot more variants available that let you discriminate if you have longer reads, whether that read came from a gene or a pseudogene. So for example, down here, there is, uh, I'm pointing to an exon that is 100% identical between the gene and the pseudogene. So NGS or Sanger sequencing would not be able to discriminate whether the read came from the gene or the pseudogene. But you can see there's a lot of variation around this exon. So if you have longer reads, it's very easy to discriminate and to correctly assign whether the sequence read came from the gene or the, or the pseudogene. Um, just a quick word about extreme sequence contexts. Um, in, especially in uh, some short tandem repeats that cause uh, neurological diseases, uh, it is important to sequence those particular regions. This is um, a region here shown for uh, the fragile X syndrome, which has uh, repeats of CGG, and so you can see um, this uh, short tandem repeat of CGG, CGG, and so forth. And um, it is of great importance in a um, clinical assay to understand whether the individual, the patient, has these um, AGG interruptions that are highlighted in red, whether there's one or two in this region of CGGs, because it affects the risk of giving uh, birth to a son that has the full fragile X syndrome. So you can see here on this graph on the right, if um, the mother only has CGGs here on the bottom, her risk of giving birth to a son with the full fragile X uh, syndrome disease is 80%. And if she has two of these AGG interruption, that goes down to 15%. So it has dramatic uh, implications for uh, parental counseling, for prenatal diagnostics, and so forth. And uh, in a paper by Joris Vermeesh and others in Belgium, um, a recent paper uh, from last year, it was shown that um, single molecule real-time sequencing can detect these AGG interruptions in male and female FMR1 premutation carriers. So those are individuals that are at risk of giving um, uh, offspring this particular disease. Um, the um, researchers show the detailed workflow and the de novo assembly of this particular targeted region into the two alleles, being able to confidently identify these AGG interruptions in many individuals. And so this method will facilitate research and diagnostic analysis of this um, important uh, fmr one repeat expansion for fragile X syndrome. In general, as I alluded to, many, uh, especially neurological diseases, have at their cause uh, repeat expansion. So um, we talked about fmr one um, there's a muscular dystrophy, a Huntington's disease, and a large number of these ataxias um, that have 
uh, these expansions of short tandem repeats, and those are in general very difficult to resolve with NGS. Some of these are even difficult to amplify with PCR, and for that reason, we are, um, we are developing an amplification-free targeted enrichment method that is using the enzyme Cas9 for targeting a particular region in the genome. There's no amplification, so it sequences the native DNA. And so the way this works is um, you have your input DNA, about 5 to 10 micrograms. A normal smart bell library is being prepared, as you would normally do for sequencing. And then the Cas9 enzyme is used to target the particular region or regions of interest, and then it's subjected to smart sequencing. And because of the Cas9 enzyme, you can actually uh, target multiple regions in the genome, and it's also compatible with barcoding, which makes it very efficient. And so here you have an example from the same patient um, is targeted four different disease loci, Huntington's disease, um, fMR1, so fragile X syndrome, um, the ALS locus, that's for Lou Gehrig's disease, and one type of the spinocerebellar ataxia in the same reaction. And you can see that for um, each of the different loci, we have well over 100 molecules um, that allow um, a confident consensus and a characterization of these uh, particular uh, loci. So um, one example is shown here from this patient. Uh, this is the Huntington's disease locus. So you can see um, these um, uh, mountaintops uh, denote the, different, the two different alleles. So here in the maternal allele, you have 18 CIG repeats followed by 10 CGG repeats. And in the uh, father allele, you have 60 CIGGs and uh, seven CGGs. And so then similar here for fMR1, uh, two AGG interruptions in one allele and one AGG interruptions in a much longer expanded uh, CGG uh, allele. So it's possible there for um, with um, PEG biosequencing to confidently um, characterize some of these loci that are even um, impossible to faithfully replicate with PCR because this particular method does not use amplification. And because it doesn't use amplification, the methylation pattern are preserved. And so at the same time, it's possible with smart sequencing to highlight and resolve the methylation status of those particular loci, which in some cases is very important because it affects the uh, gene, gene activity um, of those particular genes. Um, so then with regard to minor variant detection, PECBIO is, uh, PEC bio sequencing is very powerful for minor variant detection because of the high accuracy that um, PECBIO um, um, provides. Uh, this has been demonstrated in many uh, peer-reviewed publications. I just show a, a few um, and a, a small selection of them. And uh, just one example of this paper where the authors um, found that smart sequencing exceeds the consensus accuracy achieved by other sequencing methods because the errors uh, in the reads are random, and so the consensus accuracy is very high, as I mentioned, greater than 99.999% accuracy. And so this can be achieved with two uh, different ways. All the, all the previous examples that I've highlighted uh, that are used for genotyping or Mendelian diseases uh, use what is considered standard sequencing. So you have a number of different molecules, you sequence those molecules, you align them to the reference, and then you build a consensus sequence that allows you to identify the variants. Here's a homozygous variant, and there, here is a um, heterozygous variant. For minor variant detection, of course, where you would like to detect maybe a 1% tumor uh, DNA or a 1% 1, 1 viral DNA in the background of 99% uh, wild-type DNA, we have to make a very accurate sequence determination on the single molecule level. And so for that, we have a special way of sequencing, which we call circular consensus sequencing, or CCS. And the way it works, as you can see in this cartoon here, the polymerase sequences the forward strand and then goes around the adapter and around the smart bell and keeps going and sequences the same um, molecule of DNA multiple times. And it sequences the forward strand and the reverse strand. So with PEC bio sequencing, it's, uh, it's the only technology that can sequence the same base of the same DNA molecule multiple times. And so now you have what we call different subreads. 
And that's the forward and the reverse trend of that same DNA molecule that's being sequenced over and over. And that allows you to build a consensus sequence for that individual molecule. And um, again, the errors are random, so it's a very highly accurate sequence. And that allows to very confidently uh, detect minor variants, um, for example, in virology or in cancer. And so we have uh, also developed and are now releasing um, a minor variant caller that is um, capable of detecting minor variants um, up to about four kilobases. Uh, currently, the initial uh, focus is in viral, HIV, HCV, HPV, but also we're branching out to oncology. Um, and um, it's reliable to 1% minor variant detection. For 1%, uh, you need about uh, um, 6,000 fold coverage. That means 1% of the reads are about 60 reads that give you a very high statistical uh, significance. And there's a very low um, false negative rate and under 1% false positive rate. Um, this is a one-click analysis um, that is part of SmartLink. It allows high multiplexing for chip, so it's cost effective. And um, the mutations are annotated and easy to interpret on the results. Um, and they're connected to the publicly available databases. So in the next slide, I just have a screenshot um, for um, BCR ABLE, the cancer gene, where you can see how the codons are affected, what amino acids are changed, and then also here um, the, uh, the drug sensitivity. And so here are the uh, frequencies. So a very easy to interpret um, output that um, aids the clinicians to then make informed decisions um, for the researchers. Uh, for, the, for the clinicians make informed decisions for the patients. So then lastly, I'd like to uh, spend a few minutes at the end of my talk um, uh, highlighting whole genome sequencing. And so, of course, um, within two human individuals, the vast majority of variation is actually not in single nucleotide variants. They make up about five megabases um, and then indels about three megabases but it's actually um, the majority of the, very, the genetic variation between two individuals is in so-called structural variants. Those are larger um, uh, forms of variations, larger deletions, larger insertions, greater than 50 bases and so forth. And so the vast majority of bases is contained in these um, uh, structural variants and then in indels. So um, with PECBio, it has been shown that it is possible to detect these types of uh, structure variants. There is about 20,000 of them, about 10,000 deletions and 10,000 insertions. Whereas with the Illumina technology, there's a large blind spot and only about 4,000 of those uh, 20,000 structure variants can be detected. The reason for this deficiency is repeat regions, GC-rich regions and larger insertions. So any study of human variation is incomplete um, unless PEC Biosmart sequencing is applied to identify these structure variants um, uh, completely. Um, so this has been demonstrated. The first paper was a nature paper by Evan Eichler and others resolving the complexity of the human genome using single molecule sequencing. And there have been many other papers um, that have published that um, highlight this capability. I do want to take um, a moment and compare the structure variation calling performance to other technologies because there's been a lot of interest in the community and questions how uh, PECBio compares to other technologies such as 10x genomics or nanopore sequencing. And so in this table is shown the same individual with regard to the ability of PECBio to call deletions and insertions and PECBio uh, does very well. So this is data from the SQL system with actually quite low coverage, so only tenfold coverage uh, recovers very well over 7,000 deletions and over 7,000 insertions. In contrast, the 10x genomics technology is not very sensitive to deletions. Only 3,000 are uh, identified and currently it's not possible to call insertions with the techno 10x genomics technology. Similarly, um, Oxford Nanopore technology has been used to sequence the same individual at actually twice the coverage um, compared to PEGBio at 20-fold coverage. And there's a large false positive. So there's way too many deletions that are being called, three times more than there should be, almost 30,000. And that's because of the poor accuracy and the high level of systematic error in the nanopore technology. And um, in contrast, um, the sensitivity for insertions is actually quite low. Um, so there are um, way fewer insertions called 
um, compared to PEG bio. And then Illumina, it's well known that it's quite poor, only about 2,000 deletions and about 1,000 insertions. So PEG bio clearly is the best in class for structure variation calling, whereas the other technologies have very poor sensitivity and or high false positive rates. This has also been um, noted by the research community. Mike Schatz gave a talk at the AGBT meeting in February comparing PECBio with the 10X genomics technology and found that the PECBio call cells are self-consistent, whether the, um, whereas the 10X genomics um, technology and Illumina is not self-consistent over the different um, uh, structure variant callers for those technologies. Um, the uh, 10X genomics technology only calls very large events, they have little overlap, and the Illumina call sets are even worse. There are artifacts, uh, spurious, false positive deletions with the 10X genomics technology, and um, effectively no tandem repeat expansions can be measured with 10X genomics. Um, similarly, with Oxford Nanopore uh, technology, the research community has looked at that and uh, found that the count of deletion variants is very high over 50,000 deletions, so five times uh, more than should be there, and the validation rate is very low. Um, so this researcher found that the validation rate was only 35%, so only a third of the calls are actually real, and two-thirds of the calls are uh, artifacts. And then lastly, um, with regard to non-sequencing-based structure variation, the bio-nanogenomics bio technology has been uh, employed to try to measure um, structure variants. However, um, the next generation mapping has a very poor resolution for um, uh, resolving the breakpoints. Um, so the breakpoints are only detected within a window of about three kilobases. And so um, that makes it very difficult to then, uh, with these imprecise breakpoints, it makes it impossible to evaluate the impact on gene structure without follow-up sequencing. Of course, bio-nanogenomics does not provide any sequence, so you would then still have to follow it up with sequencing. And so um, PECBio is the only long-read sequencing provider that uh, has base pair resolution for variants of all sizes. And in fact, it is best in class for detecting structure variants over all different size ranges. So in this particular graph, you see um, over the size ranges of 50 to 100, uh, base pairs, 100 base pairs to a kilobase, one to three kilobases, and over three kilobases. In all cases, PECBio has the best sensitivity to this particular truth set by um, the NIST consortium, whereas the other technologies are struggling. So then uh, we have, we're now seeing that um, this capability is being utilized in the clinic, and this paper is actually the first um, application uh, in general, where long-read sequencing has been used to identify causal structure variants for a patient uh, in a Mendelian disease. This paper just published uh, last week, in fact, um, by you and Ashley and colleagues. Um, this was an individual that had a heart defect and had tumors growing in his heart. Um, you can see there's an example here and another here. And the clinical testing of short-read sequencing had um, come back negative um, with their standard pipelines. However, the patient was considered for a heart transplant, so the clinicians really wanted to know the underlying uh, genetic. And uh, low fold coverage, only 10 fold coverage of um, uh, um, PEC bio sequencing with the SQL system, identified uh, about 7,000 deletions and insertions one of them was a heterozygous 2.1 kilobase deletion that deleted the first exon of this particular gene that, and that um, uh, causes this autosomal dominant carney complex which provided the diagnosis for this particular patient. So as I mentioned, this paper came out uh, last week. There was a, a press release by Stanford University highlighting uh, that this is the first time in a patient that long read sequencing was used um, to make this diagnosis. You and Ashley commented that this allows us to illuminate dark corners of the genome like never before. And there's been quite a lot of other uh, press that we've been pleased to see uh, in Stat News, in a medical first, uh, long read DNA sequencing solves a diagnostic mystery, uh, Fierce Biotech, and we also had a blog post uh, on our website to highlight this new uh, achievement. 
Um, so we are also making it easier for um, all of you to uh, do this type of analysis. So we now have our own uh, structure variant caller that is integrated into our SmartLink Smart Analysis Pipeline. It's a web-based interface that is easy to use and gives you reports um, like uh, shown here in table format and graph format with regard to deletions, insertions, and then uh, puts out the VCF and bed files that you can then integrate uh, with your normal uh, workflow. So that makes the structure variant analysis really easy. And then uh, lastly, um, of course, the field is moving towards uh, human de novo genome assembly, so getting away from the human reference genome concept. And PECBio, of course, has, used, has been used here um, uh, to demonstrate that it is now possible using PECBio to generate high quality um, human de novo genome assemblies. Here's just a few papers. Um, this was a paper last year um, by Dr. So et al. Uh, in Nature highlighting the um, Korean human reference genome that is currently the most contiguous diploid human genome assembly to date. Many uh, um, structure variants were identified, novel deletions, novel insertions, over 7,000 novel insertions, and you can see the breakdown here of many different types were identified in just this one sample. And so there's now, uh, we're pleased to see that in many regions of um, the globe, uh, the researchers are uh, establishing high quality ethnic reference genomes that are better suited for their particular uh, patient cohorts, um, including uh, in Asia, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, Vietnamese, uh, Singapore population, etc. And so these um, high quality PEC biogenomes will be much more useful for patient cohort studies, for population studies and disease studies for these particular ethnic groups. And uh, the leadership uh, role that PECBio has assumed in the area of uh, de novo genome assembly, I think was nicely highlighted with this special issue of genome research that appeared in May um, last month, uh, because more than half of the articles, 12 out of the total of 22 articles, featured PECBio data, genome assemblies, or, or genome annotations. So we're pleased by these uh, articles and congratulate the the, all the authors on their um, um, on their very important work that's described therein. So uh, with that, I'd like to close to give you um, uh, in a view into the uh, roadmap of where we're moving the technology forward, because um, these um, de novo assemblies that I spoke about were um, uh, dedicated and uh, uh, fairly substantial efforts. And of course, we are committed to make this uh, more cost effective and faster so that many more uh, patients can be subjected to this type of analysis. And so um, for this, our SQL roadmap calls for a uh, quite dramatic increase in the overall throughput per sequencing run. Um, within this year, we will increase the throughput per SQL smart cell by a factor of two. Then we will repeat this in the next year, in 2018, by another twofold increase in throughput. And then at the end of 2018, we will introduce a new chip, um, a new SQL uh, smart cell array that has an eightfold increase in the number of um, sequencing sites from currently 1 million to 8 million. These increases are multiplicative, meaning uh, 2 times 2 times 8, that's about a, a factor of 30 fold increase going from currently about 5 to 8 gigabases per smart cell to about 150 gigabases per smart cell on the same SQL instrument. That's about 50-fold um, coverage, um, and that's enough for a de novo assembly. So this will facilitate then going um, to a very cost-effective and efficient de novo assembly of individual human genomes. So we are anticipating that by that time, um, you can switch from the so-called $1,000 genome that's um, been marketed by Illumina, uh, which of course is not a genome, it's a table of single nucleotide variants, um, but with PECBio you will get, for about the same uh, price that you would have paid for Illumina, you would get a real genome, a de novo assembly with all the variants, both the SNPs and the structure variants. And we're pleased to see that um, some institutions have uh, invested and are getting ready for this transition that will happen in the uh, human genetics field by 
uh, investing in a, a large number of SQL systems um, and uh, um, uh, so Grandomics first and then Novogene acquiring multiple um, numbers of SQL systems to now uh, engage in these types of population studies and getting high quality human genomes for uh, really the next step and the next era in human uh, genome sequencing. Uh, more um, immediately uh, in a SQL System 5.0 release that will have um, a new four reaction sequencing kit uh, compared to the eight reaction kit that we have now. Uh, we'll have an internal control for performance monitoring. There will also be a number of reliability updates, um, some uh, updates and making it easier for the customers uh, to run their samples. And then on the software side, uh, we will implement the minor variant analysis that I highlighted in the SmartLink uh, analysis, the structure variant caller that I uh, talked about, as well as having other improvements in the consensus calling and in the uh, Falcon Unzip uh, genome assembly. So with that, I'd like to summarize and close um, by uh, highlighting that uh, we believe that there are many different opportunities, unique opportunities that complement what you can do with NGS, uh, getting at uh, particular disease relevant genes that are not possible to be sequenced with NGS, as well as um, comprehensive structure variation detection and de novo assembly. And so with that, I'd like to thank all of our users, both on the RS2, as well as the SQL system. You saw that most of the uh, things that I talked about were not done by um, us, but were done by the researchers. And so we are very grateful for all the scientists who are spending their time and efforts uh, applying the technology. This has resulted in now well over 2,000, excuse me, over 2,000 publications. And the rate of new papers uh, is about three to, new, three to four new papers per day that highlight the usage of um, PEC biosequencing in all the different fields of science. And um, uh, with that, I close and thank all the uh, employees at PEC Bio who work hard every day to bring this uh, to bring this technology to your research as well. Thank you very much.